Steve is kind of like a giant lamb. But he will lean over to you at the dinner table and whisper something to you that'll make you sleep with the lights on for a couple of months. He's come from nothing to being one of our wealthiest writers. He's an actor when he writes. He's a character actor. I've got a film career because of Stephen King. I like to have my hooks into the reader entirely. And really, if I had my druthers, I'd have somebody in a situation where they would get to the end of chapter nine and say, I think I'll sleep with the light on. He's often seen strictly as a horror novelist, but he's anything but. Fright drives his work and is sort of the engine behind the reader's response to it, but his work uh, is a lot more significant than people give it credit for. Hello? Anybody here? Do I like to scare people? Yeah, I do. And uh, do I like the idea that I, I'm referred to and sometimes dismissed as a horror writer? No, I don't. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Stephen. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. When Stephen King turned 50, the best-selling American author celebrated the end of his fifth decade, not in a bookshop surrounded by writers, but on a film set with movie stars. And stars don't come much bigger than Tom Hanks, the head warder in The Green Mile, an adaptation of one of King's prison stories. I know what I'm wishing for, and I'm wishing for, I can't say it out loud, that I want this to be the number one picture and win all the Academy Awards, because that would make the wish not come true. But if I was going to say it out loud, it would be something like that. <laughs> Have we just been jammed? <laughs> <laughs> Usually you throw around the names, you know, Stephen King, and you think you're going to be getting this very particular kind of brand of a horror story. And this is really not. This is really more of like a... a it's more of a mystery than it is anything else. Not unlike, you know, the better aspects of the Shawshank Redemption with some, with some other, you know, elements to it that, you know, make it a, a, a extremely compact story all at the same time. I gotta tell you, it's so compact that we're all going nuts because working on this movie is, is just like working, <laughs> you know, in a minimum security prison, you know. We're free to roam the halls, but we can't leave. We go to the same place every day. It's very grim. It's very uh, uh, dingy. I mean, it's, it's atmospheric, but it's not a real pleasant atmosphere. The Green Mile is a story about a series of miracles on death row in Cold Mountain Penitentiary. What do you want, John Coffey? Just to help. He's such a traditional storyteller, really. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I compare him to Mark Twain, I'm, I'm really not being at all facetious. 
he's very much a, a, a traditionalist in weaving a tale, uh, which, which is sort of what leads me by the nose back toward a, a more traditional kind of filmmaking. He somehow is able to, to really create these characters that are, are, are flawed but good, by and large, and also characters who are flawed and evil, <laughs> you know, uh, or actually are characters who are positive and and uh, and evil at the same uh, all at the same time. So it's not like you know it's not like a matter of every one set is good at two shoes and the other people are you know the strict heavies. I, I think you you always are able to understand the motivations of the people who are bad. Over the last 25 years, King has become the most popular novelist with Hollywood filmmakers. Almost all of his books have been turned into movies or television. He made his name back in the 70s with horror classics like Carrie and The Shining. But as with all of King's work, his stories are also about deep emotional trauma and are set in a world that's familiar and even humdrum. One thing that he did that Steven Spielberg did in the realm of fantasy was ground it in the real world. Uh, you see references to brand names, to make people eat at McDonald's, they shop at Kmart, they do all the things that we do in the real world that you weren't used to seeing in, in television and films. He took horror out of the, out of the uh, uh, creaky old castle in Transylvania and, and, and really placed it next door. Maine is the setting for almost all of King's fiction. It's a sparsely populated region close to the Canadian border, and on the surface, one of the most beautiful and serene places in America. But he's turned it into the bloodiest, creepiest, most frightening state in the Union. Maine is basically a backwoods state, and it's very poor. It's one of the last places in America that's actually a region. In Maine, you have people who have a you know, very distinctive accent, so that outlanders sometimes have trouble understanding them. Um, they, m most of them dress exactly the same way. They're missing a bunch of teeth. You know, they're, they're, they're wearing feedlot caps. Uh, they drive pickups. The rawness is still there. It, it doesn't have that bland quality that Americans tend to associate with the word suburbia. The real violence in the United States is committed by people who feel very much like they're on the margins of, uh, of success or the margin of popularity. And I think King has penetrated what that's all about, and he's found it by, by staying in Maine. Stephen King has spent most of his life in Maine. He was brought up by his mother in the tiny town of Durham, so small it doesn't even have a main street. His father disappeared when he was very young. When I was two, he left. He just bugged out, gone. And we moved around a lot after that, and uh, I think that she was looking for him, trying to get him to pay support. She died of cancer. And toward the end, she, she had all this medication, all this dope, and she was stoned most of the time. And when I was visiting her near the end, she said, you know, Stephen, for a while, just before World War II, your father uh, was a vacuum cleaner salesman. And she kind of chuckled in this dreamy way that people do when they're doped. And she said, your father was the only salesman Electrolux ever had who could sell vacuum cleaners to widows at 2 o'clock in the morning. This is um, where I went to grammar school. We moved here when I was, I think, eight, and I was in the fifth grade. Went to fifth, sixth, seventh grade here, and uh, I was definitely the smartest pupil in my class because there were only three of us, and there was 
uh, one kid who was a, a stutterer and, and the other one was mentally enfeebled and then there was me. It hasn't changed as much as I thought. Um, this road used to be all dirt when I was a kid. Um, but the Harrington's house is still over there and that's my aunt's house down there, uh, the, the brick one. And, uh, you know, we used to pick blueberries in this field until they turned it over for beans. And uh, that's where we went. We didn't have running water either, and that's where we went to get a shower. If we wanted a shower or a bath, we'd walk down across the field and go there. When I was a kid, we'd come down here and, uh, and fish. Nobody ever went swimming. Hey, you know, it's not that deep. You can walk across. One hot day, we decided, what the hell, we're all going to go swimming. There was about six or seven of us down here, you know, just goofing around. And we had our inner tubes and stuff. You paddle around in them. And... You know I came on! <laughs> this one friend of mine, David Hanna, did a handstand, and his feet came right up out of the water. And holy shit, he's covered with these black things. They're all over his legs. You know, he's a redhead. He's a little chubby pink legs. Vern, there's something on your neck. Yeah, right. I'm not falling for that one, a chance. No, Vern, there is something on your neck. It's a leech. And I took a look at that, and I go, Jesus, I cannot believe that. we got to get out of here. So we all shit. go out, and we were covered with them. We were covered with bloodsuckers. And uh, we picked them off each other the best way that we could. And we're all crying. And, and, uh, and this, uh, my cousin, Robbie Donahue, saying, be careful, be careful. If you pull them too hard, you'll leave their mouths in them and they'll infect and all this other stuff. So we're pulling them off. And some of them are dropping off because they're full. And then I hear uh, this one kid saying, Oh my God, look at this. And he's got his bathing suit out like this and he's looking in his bathing suit. And uh, <laughs> he's going, Steve, help me. You gotta help me, you gotta get it off. I says, I'm not reaching inside your bathing suit, Chris, man. I'm not doing that, you'll have to. So he reached down and he brought his hand out. His hand is just covered with blood. He got the thing off. The thing was huge. It had, it had battened on his testicles. It had gotten in his bathing suit somehow, battened on his testicles. Gordy, man, and he said, Gordy, Gordy. here he is. And he just, his eyes rolled up, and he went right over backward in a dead faint. And uh, some, about 10 years later, I was working on this story called The Body. It became a film, Stand By Me. And I was thinking about that, and I stuck that in there, and I stuck in everything that I could remember from the time. It was no big plan to write about uh, my past, to write about childhood. Just uh, a bunch of kids going down a railroad track to find a, a dead body. And I found that I had something where I could basically hang a lot of the things from my childhood. Boring stories nobody would want to hear otherwise. If you look at his descriptions of childhood, it's a, he represents it as a pretty embattled state in which mainly one's relief is to be found in the loyalty of those, of, of those other children who will befriend you and in the exercise of imagination. Hey, Gordo, why don't you tell us a story? Uh, I don't know. Oh, come on. Yeah, come on, Gordo. But not one of your horror stories, okay? I don't want to hear no horror stories. I'm not up for that, man. Why don't you tell us one about Sergeant Steele and his babbling leathernecks? Well, the one I've been thinking about is kind of different. It's about this python contest. And the main guy of the story is this fat kid that nobody likes named Davy Hogan. He's like Charlie Hogan's brother, if he had one. Good, Vern. Millions of children have uh, less than blissful childhoods, but very few of them turn out to be good writers. Uh, so it's not, it's not causal, you know. It's just that uh, for a child who is a budding writer, the form of the, form of the childhood uh, that is lived uh, ex affects uh, the eventual prose. Most of his work is rooted in a childhood trauma, um, a, a violation of a child. Uh, the plot may have to do with a character as an adult, but somewhere in that book, you're going to find that 
a character is defined by a childhood event. 